Hear NFL legends, players, coaches, and media members from around the country sharing their insights and stories with us year-round. Here on Thursday night, tailgate, 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 tail, 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 tailgate. And now back with us here on Thursday Night Tailgate is author Jeff Perlman. Jeff has written several wonderful books, including The Bad Guys One about the 1986 Mets, Sweetness about the life of Walter Payton, The Rocket That Fell to Earth about Roger Clemens, Love Me, Hate Me about uh, Barry Bonds, Showtime about the L.A. Lakers of the 1980s, Gunslinger, a biography about Brett Favre, which Oh, by the way, was a number one bestseller on Amazon. He's got a new book out right now titled Football for a Buck, The Crazy Ride and the Crazier Demise of the USFL. And we're excited that Jeff is back with us again tonight here on Thursday Night Tailgate. Hey, Jeff, Chris and Bob, thanks for coming back on the show. Hey, Jeff. Wait, I got to ask, did you guys have Lynn Kane on your show today? Yes, we did. 815, a little while ago. So I just want to say, and this is totally random. My son Emmett, he's only 11, and I are enormous Lynn Kane fans. He's probably my son. He's one of my sons who never saw him play top five all-time NFL players. And for the sole reason that, like, in 1980, Lynn Kane had one of the best Afros in pro football. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I wish I had known. We'd have passed that along to him earlier tonight. Oh, man. We love – when we play laser tag, I'm not kidding, my son names himself Lynn Kane. I kid you not. Wow. <laughs> yep. That's yeah, outstanding. Well. Mm-hmm. So, Jeff, we got to get, uh, you want to get into your new book because, uh, oh, by the way, it's sitting right here next to me and it's fantastic. I've started reading it and a um, uh, big fan of, of the USFL back in the 80s, hated it when it disappeared. So talk about how it got started and what killed it. Do you remember it well? I do. Yeah. Yeah, I love the USFL. So, um, the USFL started, and it, the idea was uh, 1960s was the first time. David Dixon, an art dealer in New Orleans, came up with the idea. Spring football, not a direct rival to the NFL. Uh, regional drafts, so wherever you have franchises, you're drafting out of nearby colleges. Uh, you know, not going to have too high payroll. Let's just keep it, keep it smart. And then, he, you know, he started because he wanted an NFL team in New Orleans, and the NFL kept ignoring New Orleans. But then the Saints came, so he dumped the idea. But he never fully forgot it. And then in the 1980s, he, um, he sort of brought it back and he talked to George Allen, the old Redskins coach, about it. And George Allen loved the idea. So they kind of brought it back. And that was it, 1980s. Uh, let's have a spring football league. Nobody's doing anything in spring. You know, March Madness wasn't big yet. Baseball was super long. Uh, the NFL was really starting to take off. Pro football was starting to take off. So uh, that was the beginning of the USFL, the idea. In the first season was 1983. So give us the opposite side of the coin. What killed it? Uh, for all, I don't know your guys' politics, but this is not a political statement, but Donald Trump probably. Um, he basically, if I'm just being honest, he, uh, so he had a pretty good first season in 1983. Donald Trump bought the New Jersey Generals in 1984. In the lead-up to buying the team, he talked about how great the USFL was, and he was excited to be a part of it. As soon as he got the Generals, we need to move to fall. We need to challenge the NFL. He had a meeting with Pete Rozelle, the NFL commissioner. He didn't tell any of the uh, USFL owners about it. Where he, t- he said it was at the Pierre Hotel in New York City. Trump paid for the suite. And he told Rosell, um, I don't care about the USFL. What do I have to do to get an NFL franchise? Um, he then pushed for, pushed for a merger. He tried, and ultimately it was his idea we're going to sue the NFL uh, for violating, uh, for not monopolizing TV. And he led this lawsuit against the NFL. He guaranteed the other owners it would work out. He's very confident. He hired their attorneys, he set it all up. They ended up suing them, and they just kind of got slaughtered. And they won the case, but they were only given a dollar. Because the jury decided the USFL's demise was the fault of the USFL. So it breaks my heart. I love that league. Agreed. And we were just talking to Bo Bach, who is uh, you know down here in Atlanta, been in sports talk radio here since the since the 70s. And uh, we were talking about when Herschel Walker you know, decided to to leave uh, the University of Georgia and go join the USFL. Yeah. You know, Herschel's a god here in the state of Georgia. So talk about some, and, you know, you've got a wonderful chapter about it in your book. Talk about what went on behind the scenes when Herschel was a junior and, you know, how his parents you know, wanted him to, to go ahead and go and, and, uh, and start his, you know, his pro football career because they were so afraid that he was going to end up getting injured. But talking about the stuff with Herschel. 
Well, it was interesting because at the time, the NFL didn't take juniors. And he had just won the Heisman Trophy. Uh, he was the best college football player in the country, and there was no close second. I think people forget how dominant Herschel Walker was. He was not just Cam Newton or Deshaun Watson or whoever. You know, he was a dominant Herculean figure in college football. Uh, and he didn't want to return to Georgia. And, but he, he had no options. So the USFL comes along and his agent calls the USFL and reaches out to them and says Herschel wants to come out. And the NFL, the USFL was very hesitant about it. Because at the time, again, the NFL was not uh, you know, anyone but seniors. And they didn't know how it would come across. But ultimately they decided how could you, pa- how could you bypass having the best amateur player in the country to join your league? So Herschel Walker was the first. That was a bombshell. That was an absolute bombshell where it said to the NFL, holy crap, this league is serious. They're going after our guys and guys we want, uh, and they're going to have a lot of money. So Walker going to the U.S. event was a huge, huge deal. Five questions for Jeff. Great to speak with you again, Jeff. And more about Walker. I, I was telling Chris, I got to meet him in the early 80s at the NBC studios in New York, and I shook his hand, and I just – could not believe a guy that big could run that fast, and what we were to expect to him was just phenomenal. But uh, this guy, do you think, Jeff, if he played his entire career in the NFL, I know the rule was in place, but do you think he probably would have a couple more thousand yards? He should probably be in the Hall of Fame. I think he should be in the Hall of Fame now. I'll tell you something that bothers me. I don't know how you guys feel about it, or if you know why or have a justification, but so... Pick who you want, Herschel Walker, Sam Mills. You know, a lot of guys who are borderline, or a bunch of guys who are borderline Hall of Famers or fringe Hall of Famers, but the Pro Football Hall of Fame, it's not the NFL Hall of Fame, it's the Pro Football Hall of Fame, does not consider anything you do in the USFL to be a factor. So even guys who got in, Steve Young, his two years of the LA Express do not exist to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Tim Kelly, his two years with the Houston Gamblers do not exist. A guy like Sam Mills, who arguably was the best player in the USFL, who was all USFL three years in a row. I think with that, if you take that into consideration, I mean, I think he's a Hall of Famer anyway. But you throw that in, he has to be a Hall of Famer. But they don't even consider it. And I really find that, um, I can't say unforgivable, but inexplicable. Because, again, it's not the NFL Hall of Fame. It is the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Herschel Walker, in his last year in the USFL, 1985, when he was a loaded league, Ran for 2,411 yards. That's still the pro football single season record. And nobody even knows it. It doesn't even tell It's nowhere. I just, I hate that so much. So if you give Herschel Walker three more years in the NFL, yeah, I think he is a Hall of Famer. I think he probably should be a Hall of Famer anyway. And I, that was my next question. Jeff, of some of the guys that put that league on the map, you had mentioned, I, I was going to bring up Jim Kelly. I forgot all about Steve Young that he spent those years there. But uh, how about some of the other players that our, uh, our listeners may have forgot that while you were doing the research really contributed greatly to that league? Well, I mean, there are four guys who, who made the Pro Football Hall of Fame. You have Young, you have Kelly, you have Reggie White, who started with the Memphis Showboats, uh, and you had Gary Zimmerman the offensive lineman who started with the LA Express. So there were a lot of guys. I mean, there's just, Nate Newton was a Tampa Bay uh, bandit. Derek Kennard, LA Express. Jeff Hart, LA Express. Uh, Doug Flutie, New Jersey Generals. You know, like Doug Williams, Oklahoma Outlaws. Brian Seip, New Jersey Generals. Jacksonville Bulls. The Jacksonville Bulls at one point had a starting backfield of Archie Griffin and Mike Rozier. So that's three Heisman trophies lining up behind quarterbacks. It's a really fun Keith Millard, Jackson Bulls. It's a really funky league where if you go all over the rosters, Craig James, Washington Federals, you're just like, wow, that guy, that guy was in the, how was that guy in the USFL? It's just a buffet of really quirky names that played in the USFL. And Jeff, to take that one step further, what, what are some of the more interesting things that you learned? You, you may not have been aware of going in as you're doing the research. What are some of the things that made you say, you know, really that happened? Oh, so many. I mean, you know, George Allen was the coach of the Chicago Blitz. And I don't know, I didn't, I didn't know that much about George Allen going into it. I mean, I knew his resume, but I didn't know much about it. George Allen was the coach of the Chicago Blitz, and he would do anything to win. Like anything, 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 anything. Um, their opening game, and they, the first game in the history of the USFL was the Chicago Blitz playing the Washington Federals in RFK Stadium. 
Uh, in the lead up to that game, George Allen had two of his assistants dress up in USFL windbreakers. He gave them video cameras and they went to the Washington Federals practices and told the Federals they were part of the USFL film crew and they were going around the league filming practices. So the Chicago Blitz taped all the Washington Federals practices, brought them back to Chicago, and they put in everything into their game plan. They knew everything the uh, Federals were going to run because they had two coaches taping their practices the entire week. I thought that was really interesting. Um, The Boston Breakers, uh, in 1983, they signed Dave Remington. They agreed to terms with Dave Remington, the Outland Trophy winner out of Nebraska. That was a huge signing for the Breakers. It was all over newspapers. And they sent, they, they agreed to terms over the phone. And then they sent a contingency to uh, Logan Airport to greet Dave Remington, give him a hero's welcome. Well, Dave Remington isn't on the plane. And it turns out someone was just playing a prank with on them, pretending to be Dave Remington. And Dave Remington never signed with the Boston Breakers and never had any intention. So they show up at the plane and they realize nobody's there because he didn't agree to sign with them. There's like a million stories just like that. It's the craziest thing wow. ever. So, so Jeff, we, we you know, it ultimately fails, right? And now we've got yeah. a couple of other rival leagues that we're hearing about. The Alliance of American Football, which is supposed to start up after the Super Bowl. They're supposed to be re, you know, reigniting the XFL after that. So is, is there enough that, that you think that people would be interested in a rival league, even if it's in the spring? I mean, it's not going to go head to head. But is there enough yeah. interest for one of these other leagues to actually, you know, pull it off? if they could take a lesson from what happened to the USFL? I think maybe, but not definitely. I think one of the things that's really different now compared to then is how ubiquitous football is now. I mean, you know, back in the 80s when I was growing up, you had a game on Sunday, so I'd watch the Jets on Sunday play whoever growing up in New York, and then there'd be Monday night football. And that was pretty much it for the week for me in football. Now, as you know, Sunday all day, Monday night, Sunday night, also Thursday night, um, there's the NFL Network, there's fantasy football. Like, it never ends, and it never goes away. So I think there's less of a void to fill. You know, like, the idea was there's this void in the spring. But now you're watching the combine, you're watching the draft, there's always updates, personnel. There were trades back then, now, and there's free agency now. I don't know if there's enough of a void left for people to be interested in watching the uh, – the Orlando Apollo play the uh, Atlanta Knights. I just don't know. Those are actually the team names. I just don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea. I think probably not, though. Jeff, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about some of your other books uh, because you're a fantastic writer and you've got so many great Thank books you. out there. Bob and I are both Red Sox fans, and uh, you've got the book about Roger Clemens, The Rocket That Fell to Earth, and he is a guy that, you know, Red Sox Nation loved and now pretty much yeah. despises. What, what are some yeah. of the things that, that you learned about Roger when you were putting that book together? Well, it was my least favorite book to write because um, he was not in and of himself that interesting. You know, like I like people who are introspective and have doubts and conf- conflicts and they're kind of, you know, they, they're just, their lives are journeys that are really interesting. His life was not such a fascinating journey. I always say, if you took a brain scan of Roger Clemens' thoughts, it would be baseball, food, breast, sleep. Baseball, <laughs> food, breast, sleep. The thing that was fascinating about him, because sometimes what does it is um, you find the characters around a person. His brother, his, his hero is his older brother, Randy Clemens, and he ended up having a really bad drug problem. And his sister-in-law was actually killed by people looking for drugs. Uh, and that was all a result of his older brother. The other thing is, when he was coming up um, in Little League, he was the second best pitcher on his Little League baseball team behind a girl named Kelly Curzan. And he had a really tough time growing up in Ohio in the rotation behind Kelly Curzan. That was a tough thing for him and his ego to take. He did, but it was tough. So little things like that were very interesting. But um, it was not the most interesting character I've ever about. Bob, more for Jeff? And Jeff, I had told you last time one of my favorite books was Gunslinger because I was a big Far fan. And, and, and last yeah. we heard from him, Jeff, that I guess he had a, a tryout to be a, a, a color guy on the uh, some yeah. kind of football broadcast. Didn't work out. 
he's the kind of guy, you know he took a beating during his days, Jeff. I'm not sure if that had anything to do with it. What do you see for his future? What do you think he might end up doing? And what is he doing now? See, I don't think, I think his biggest problem, he's actually in really good health. It's, I don't keep in touch with him, but I do keep in touch with his mother, which is so weird, yeah. but I really do. And I, his mom is the best. And um, I don't think he was meant to be a commentator. And I don't think he was meant to be a coach. I think once he was done, he was actually sort of done. I don't think he's a guy who do that happy breaking down plays or you know, diagramming plays. He does actually a lot of triathlons with his wife. Um, he keeps himself in ridiculous. He, so he got in really bad shape after he was done. And one day he saw himself in a, in a picture and he was like, God, I'm a fat slob. This is not good. And he, he got into really good shape. He also seems like he's very involved in his kids' lives. He's a grandfather, which is super weird. He's only like 49, but he's a grandpa. Um, he seems very content in life, I got to say. He really does. He's living in Mississippi and being him. I think I relate to you last time also, Jeff, that Walter Payton was my favorite football player ever. I, I Over the 50 years or so that I've been following football, I still don't know if there's too many that played the game better than him. Yeah. Expound on that. Well, I don't like you. I consider Walter Payton a true hero. And one of my – I mean, my son is 11, and he has a Walter Payton jersey, and he has Walter mm-hmm. Payton's photo on his, on his wall. Um, I've told him so much about Walter Payton through the years. I was when I was in Sports Illustrated in 1999. I was 27 years old. I was working my way up, and an editor named Rich O'Brien called me to his office one day and said, uh, "How would you feel about going to interview Walter Payton?" And at the time, Walter Payton was dying. He had this disease and he was dying, but he was trying to promote sort of uh, organ donations. Um, and I went out to Illinois and I went to his office and I sat across from him. And he was emaciated, and his eyes were jaundiced, yellow. And it was stirring. It was stirring, and that stuck with me, and it still sticks with me. Um, So writing about him and writing biography, I just thought he was a really fascinating guy. I didn't think there was that much known about him. Um, He really seemed very intelligent and very sort of self-deprecating and also sort of self-analytical, which he was. Uh, He was very conflicted. He had a lot of sort of highs and lows in his life. I just really wanted to know more about him. And the beauty of this job, you know, just like digging into the USFL or digging into Roger Clements, you get to take these things that you're fascinated by and, and delve deep. And that was sort of the motivation for Sweetness. Still, of all the projects I've worked on, my two favorite are the USFL and Sweetness. So, Jeff, before we let you go, what's next for you? Uh, I, I'm doing an NBA book. I can't say what it is because I'm paranoid. And I'm just not there yet, but uh, I'm working on an NBA book, and uh, it's due in about a year. So, uh, yeah, you know, but I'm, a lot of right now is just promoting the USFL book and telling stories. And, you know, it's my favorite, it's, again, it's my favorite league, my favorite thing to talk about. It's just nonstop enjoyment. Um, so it's, it's been cool. It's been, it's been fun. I appreciate you guys having me on. Seriously. Well, we appreciate your time, Jeff, and we'd love to get you back on the show to talk more about it as, as a kid that, uh, you know, was born in Pittsburgh and, and a huge Steeler fan. I also enjoyed the Iron City Maulers and Mike Rozier and the team that they had. Oh, yeah. uh, love to talk more about that stuff. Hopefully we get the opportunity to have you back on the show again soon. Now, do you guys still, do you still pay $5,000 for an appearance? Because I never got my check the last time I was on. <laughs> I've been going to the mailbox every day waiting. Is that, is that coming? A, a see, Bob, see Bob for that, if you would. Send the mail. All right, I'll talk to Send Bob. The mail. <laughs> All right, thanks a lot for having me. I appreciate it. Good All luck. Right, take care, Jeff. All right, take care. Bye-bye. That is uh, author Jeff Perlman. And again, uh, the name of the book is Football for a Buck. I'm looking at it right here, The Crazy Rise and Crazier Demise of the USFL by Jeff Perlman. It's a, it's a great read, Bob. I'm, a, I'm about halfway through it. Really enjoyed the chapter about uh, about Herschel Walker and the, the sort of the stuff that went on behind the scenes that got him uh, into uh, into the USFL to Jeff's point. You know, the NFL at the time, if you were a junior, there was no coming out early and going into the going into the NFL. And uh, Herschel's parents were afraid that, uh, you know, one more season with Georgia was going to end up, you know, potentially getting him uh, injured. And uh, they came from very humble means. And uh, this was, you know, going to be a great way for them to change their lives. And they were not willing to put Herschel back through it. And uh, Herschel had a lot of regrets after he decided to go but uh, ultimately made a great decision and, uh, you know, the rest is history. But it's a fantastic book. I highly recommend it, Bob. Yeah, we could talk an entire show on Walker. And, of course, I'd like to talk more 
to Jeff about his Cowboys book and then how uh, they may not be America's team anymore, Chris. All right, we've got our next guest, uh, Chris Hammond, hanging online. We're going to get to Chris right on the other side of this quick station break.